Father, we do thank you that we can be here tonight and um, we thank you because we can start a new book and uh, we're back in the engine room, Lord, of uh, your word and finding out about you and we can um, spend time around you as well because it's all about you. So as we listen to this teaching, Lord, as we get on with this, um, again, free our minds, free our hearts, Lord God, give us... Um, Give us mercy and grace and the um, chains fall off, Lord, of our thinking as we gaze upon you and as we find out more about you, who you are, your identity, um, and in Jesus' name, bless it. Amen. So, the book of Hebrews, whatever number it is in your um, Bible, turn to it. Always useful. So, when we uh, talk about the word Hebrew, we've got to remember where that word comes from. And um, it comes from Abraham, really. He was the man who crossed over. And that word is Hebrew. All right? So he crossed over when he was uh, first called by God. So that's what the word Hebrew means. Right? Yeah, and it just happens to have the word cross in it. But I just thought I'd point that out to you. And um, so when the Hebrew nation, you will find that their history is littered with crossing over. All right, so what you've got is Abram first crossed over, and then you've got the, what's a fam- tell me some famous crossing overs that they did. Pardon? The Jordan before that. The Red Sea. So it's all these significant crossings. On the, and when it me- its meaning is incredible. So when they were in, the, in Egypt, the, um, the way the Jews looked at the whole kind of thing is that the, um, Egypt is always the world. Okay. Pharaoh is always Satan, in you know, in figurative language, and um, the Taskmasters is always a picture of sin that unrelentlessly lashes you, and you just can't seem to get out of its grip. Make sense? Okay. Now along comes um, you know Moses at that time, and he becomes the one who saves them uh, by them crossing over the Red Sea. The seas part. And uh, we know the story, if you've been around Christianity for more than 15 minutes, Moses goes, leads them across the sea, a couple of, two and a half million or something people, um, and they all go through, and as the um, Egyptians try to um, chase after them, the seas come down and drowns loads of them. And as we've said many times, they've found wheel, chariot wheels in the bottom, um, just off El what's it called, Shema, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a resort in Egypt, and they reckon that's where geographically was the crossing over, and there's chariot wheels in the bottom of this family, so that's an interesting study just to go off and digress over there. So what we've got immediately, because of that crossing over, we've got a rock star called Moses, okay, to them, he was the rock star, he was like like, like the the one who did it. Um, the Old Testament, no, no, you know, like, no... Um, surprise that he's like the one who's central to the thinking uh, because he they delivered them from Egypt you know and then they all right they went to the edge of this promised land and, and there's another story where they didn't have faith to go in because of the giants and the they, they thought they were going to get trodden on they actually Nephilim the word is there um, so then the, um, the one generation everybody um, over the age of 20 years of age and Joshua and Caleb you know, Joshua and Caleb was spared and everyone under 20, all right? So he had to start again with that generation. And that's why they wandered around for 40 years in the desert. Lots of stories in there. And then they come to the edge of the promised land and Moses um, messes up quite a bit. But that should have been a picture to Israel of you you've, you struck the rock, which later on Paul says, which was Christ. You struck him, right? Israel struck the rock. The, the Messiah was killed. But then the second time this incident came around, the instruction was speak to the rock, okay? Because he's now risen. But again, they struck the rock and rejected Messiah. And God took Moses, and, and it seems like, we've said this a lot, it seems really harsh that God wouldn't let him in the promised land because of that. But it was a picture of the rejection of Messiah. And God wanted Israel to see that through their rock star, Moses. So, you know, God's gonna, he, God will go there and he will say, hey, big shot, you know what I mean? this is what I'm going to make an example of you so Moses doesn't go into the promised land and Joshua is raised up to um, to cart the whole nation across now like you said the Jordan River into the promised land to take the land as promised okay and then so you've got this number of stuff going on now this story is to their minds the Christians who because these this is written to believe in Israelites okay people and probably non-believing Israelites just to try and explain it but it really is to to believe in Israelites and um, and they were of the mindset that Moses was the rock style 
the um, the Levitical priesthood was the only thing that could ever function properly, and um, and angels were central to the whole thing. I'll explain that in a minute. So what we'll do is I'll just read chapter one because that's what we're doing tonight, and then um, just try and follow with it whatever version you've got there. I'm reading from the NIV. And just to start this teaching out, it's not because I believe that it's any better or worse than anything else. It's just thought for thought. Um, and where it, where the King James is better will go for that. And where the Greek and Hebrew, you won't get any, any Hebrew in this because it's a Greek letter. Um, but we'll go to the Greek and we'll talk about that. But generally speaking, there's not a lot to be missed in here. And where it would be, we'll go to the Greek. That's what I'll do. Um, the word of God is the word of God in its original languages and um, we are doing what we can with the English translations and trying to make the best of it all right so Hebrews chapter 1 for those of you who struggle to you know follow <laughs> um, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to whom which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool for your feet? Um, and, then, uh, and then to finish chapter 1, verse 14, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So there's plenty there. So in this writing, the authorship of Hebrews is disputed. Some people um, say, Hey Brett. Some people say that it's, it's not Paul. I think it is Paul. But to then... For me to say Paul's writing would be unacademic because it's a very hotly disputed thing and um, I personally think it's Paul because he, he had the knowledge to be able to bring the Christian view into the into the Hebrew church, so into the church where the Hebrews um, gathered. So we've read the chapter now and I'm um, just going to start going down verse by verse about what's going on with it all. Um, so in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways so we know that the author of this is jewish because it's our forefathers okay so um what we what he's talking about there um these people would be like fully tuned into the prophets it's like that's their that's their um staple that's what's informed them everything they know about god um, would be through the prophets and everything they think they know about what's going to go through the future is through the prophets that was their testament you know that was their information bank from where would they would get all the information um, I'm just going to jump over to Peter chapter 3 if it's not jumped out of my bible because it usually does not really I'm just joking where is it is it the other side that's it it isn't it's there right 2 Peter chapter 3 um Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. So if you want wholesome thinking, here's where you go. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. So basically you've got two sources there. If you are a 
Christian and you say I'm rejecting, you know, the Old Testament can stay over there somewhere. Let's not dive into that. It's like Old Testament. We are new. Let's stay in the covenant that we've been blessed with and all that. Well, you'd be wrong a little bit because you'd be able to, what the assumption is of the New Testament is that you are fully conversant with the Old Testament. You know what's going on. And it's good in Hebrews because this is written to people who really did know the Old Testament better than the New so this letter is written to people who needed to be brought up to speed about what the new covenant says to people who have got this going on in their life. Now, Jesus was sent to Israel and he was sent to the people who had the most baggage about what the new covenant was about. So basically, when you became a Christian, your baggage is you're, you're a Gentile. I'm, I'm assuming everyone in the room is a Gentile, um, you know, as opposed to Jewish heritage or culture. Um, so our, our like baggage has been, I'm just a pagan in the world. I haven't got any real creed to, to, to I need to interpret when I become a Christian. Christianity will become a new thing to me and it will be a lot easier to just dive into it and, and dovetail with all of that. Um, but to a Jew, who's a believing Jew, to then become a Christian, they've got to have it all detangled and all the symbolism of what was was before Messiah, accumulating in Messiah, and then after Messiah's ascended, uh, sorry, uh, ascended, and then he's, he's glorified on his father's throne, then they've got to go, wait a minute, I've got to try and make all that culture and all that understanding be translated now into New Testament terms, and this is what Hebrews helps with, okay? We haven't got that baggage, but what's going to be good? It's a little bit like if I ask Brett about how you put, you know, like, what is it, um, IT systems in massive, you know, um, complex systems. I can't even say it, that's how much you don't know about it. <laughs> you know, But if you started to explain it to me in simple terms, somebody who also knew about it a little bit would be blessed by it because they'd be going, oh, it's, it's, um, it's um, all the things that I take for granted. Um, I'm, re I'm, refresh I'm being refreshed in them things and that's what I hope happens here some of you have been around this stuff a while that there's a refreshing and we get to we get to look at our sweet Jesus for like what is it 13 chapters and that's that's we've been in Acts which has been like we've got through it and it was historical narrative about Paul and stuff and everything like that now I just want to fix my eyes on Jesus that was great we've done Acts hello to Hebrews, you know, and um, and I'm looking forward to doing this, and hope you are. So I, and I urge you to come every week and try and just really dive into this. There's lots here. So as I said in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So that's just a statement to start getting their interest to say, yeah, we know this, okay. But in these last days. So this is a, obviously a new covenant letter. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who he appointed heir of all things. Okay? So that's a, that's for, for them, it's a switching mindset. It's like no longer are the prophets the ultimate voice that's going to, to, that you're going to hear and you're going to imbibe into your spirit as being the, um, the ultimate kind of voice, the, the thing because the, all the prophets were anticipating was Messiah would come and then from that moment onwards we're now in a new covenant where it's it's him it's all about him and it's he and he is perfect and he doesn't need anything else like a system a religion a ritual a symbolism he doesn't need any of that stuff even though that's what's happened to the church since he doesn't need any of that stuff to define him he is in and of himself glorious almighty and your source and he is enough okay no matter how bad we feel today and there is hurt today in the room and difficulty and all that kind of thing he is enough even for that and he, he can he can meet you at your your desperate point of need okay so um so he sp he's speaking through his son and through whom in the last days he's spoken to us by his son who is appointed heir of all things so ha, what's he heir of? All things. There's nothing in this earth that he isn't. Um, it turns out he's he's Lord of all. He is the Lord. And, and whether you know, we, we're going to talk later in chapter two about where, if he has been appointed all things and he has got authority um, and dominion and power, ultimate power over all things. There's still some inconsistencies in that, which is going to be discussed later. Like we keep dying. 
know what I mean? So he's obviously not Lord, or is he? We'll discuss it later, all right? Because it's a bit of a, well, hold on a minute. There's a, is that a contradiction? You know, but it's not a contradiction. We'll find out later. He's appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. That word there is A I O N, ion, okay? So the eons, that's where the word eons come from, and it's the ages, but it's got an overtone of the eternal ages. It's like the perpetual ages, the the ongoing eternals. Yeah, but it's um, it's it's the Greek word is A I O N, ion, where we get eons from, because well, we don't do the same with the diphthong that the Greek do. So it'll be an A would be an E. So that's complicated. So that's like the eternal, the perpetual. So he's made the eternal. So when someone says, who actually made, who actually made the universe? Who actually made the the the, um, the time and matter? Because this is like a scientific thing, isn't it? It's like a, the, 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 the word isn't just universe. Because if you go, you know, look at a telescope or these, some of these NASA pictures that you get from light years away, you go, that's matter that's been made, but it's also light. Wait a minute. And also, time gets messed up as well. So you've got a situation where some kind of genius must have made this because, <laughs> and um, there's lots to say about what the universe is and what the um, and, and within that there's eternal factors which we can't get our head around because we are limited to start points and end points because things die and things end and things rust and entropy and all that kind of thing. We we just can't seem to get our head around something that's never had a start and never has an end. Okay? It's hard to get grips with it, isn't it? Well, is it just me? So he's the creator, okay? The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Okay, let's just deal with that. So we've got a few... Um, We've got a few things going on there. Yep, speak up. You give me your translations. Mm. Um, the sun is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's essence. Is that an amplified Bible? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I've got to say, I'm like... Wouldn't say that in the Greek. How big's that book? That verse is about five times longer than the original verse. It's like. <laughs> I like the amplified version. It tries to get all the Greek nuances and all that stuff, and a lot of what you said there was good. Um, but the representation there. The exact representation of his being. The word there is um, a Greek word, character. Character. It's like the character. So the being and character of God is perfectly replicated in Christ. Okay, He is God. In other words. Shout. The NIV is a study Bible, so it says, as the brilliance of the sun is inseparable from the sun itself, so the sun, Jesus' radiance, is inseparable from deity, for He Himself is God second person of the trinity and it says um, exact reputation of his being jesus is not merely an image or reflection of god because the son himself is god he is absolutely authentic representation of god's being sustaining all things yeah it's pretty good and it's, it's, these are the these, these are some foundational things where you know we um it's like when we did Ephesians and we spent like seven weeks on chapter one because it was like every line was like, what? You know, you can do the same with this. And um, what the author's trying to do here is he's trying to just say it to these new Christians, these Hebrew Christians, I'm just going to give you a blast of what's gone on, you know? So he's the creator, he's the heir of all things. Uh, the prophets, just let's just put them over there for a second because they're important, but they're not primary to your understanding right now. Three, the sun, oh, I've done that one. I'm going to say it again anyway because it's cool. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. How many things is he sustaining? How many things are heir to him? All things. Okay. So all the things that we 
encounter all the things that trip us up all the things that temporary blind us all the things that um you know give us degraded love and all the kind of you know bad days that we have he is the lord and we can afford to go just a minute you know what i mean i'm not going to settle for this even though the emotional we talked about this last week didn't we? the emotional impact sometimes of the things that happen to us is so you know we're, we're supposed to be emotional we're supposed to be you know feel we're supposed to have um you know times when we you know god jesus wept you know jesus had you know sorrow and um, but he also had joy and laughter you know and he's quite funny if you look at some of the things what he's saying not going to get into that now but he, he did do some pretty funny things and it made me laugh anyway um after he had provided the purific purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven now if anyone reads that and they don't know messiah They'd be, they'd be trying to stone the words and the, the, the author. Bring the author here! You've just said that, you know, Jesus, um, prov the Son, provided purification for sins and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He's on his Father's throne, okay? Right now. as he's Right as we sit in this room, that's what he's doing. He's, he's eternal and he's glorious and he's risen and he's ascended. All power, authority and dominion has been given to him. And right now, your Jesus is alive and well and his glory he's he's just like pure light and pure holiness and pure righteousness and um you know if that that's just wonderful you know this is your jesus this is your king and you have been given um you know like the authority to be in the throne room with him you've been you know in, in prayer you can communicate with jesus you can talk to him you can you know just Words escape me just how wonderful that is that we, little old me and little old you, have been given the ability to um, be privy to the king, you know, to be in his courts, to be um, summoned and even some of you, some of us, you know, like really day to day communing with the Lord, walking it out, trying to walk it well and failing and stumbling and tripping, asking for forgiveness, get you, getting back up again with your cross, knowing that he's still glorified. The light's no dimmer because I'm rubbish at it. His glory's no less glorious because I trip and stumble and fall. His might is no less mighty because I'm mighty stupid. <laughs> you know, he's like, it never dims. He's not disappointed and he's not looking at me with scorn. He knew with i think you know those those ro eye rolls when he i got saved he goes i know what you're going to be doing and <laughs> i know what you're like and you're going to doubt and you're going to you know be messy and not very good at it and but yet still i'm going to sustain you i'm going to hold you up and i'm going to carry him um keep on forgiving you and our we're going to find out later that our job is to um keep your eyes on jesus because if you keep your eyes on you it's not going to work you know we'll be constantly disappointed we'll be constantly looking at our little flaws getting inside our own head ruminating about how we don't really you know oh gosh and then the enemy gets hold of it then you know oh, then he gets you in an headlock and then you've got weeks and weeks of trying to crawl back no let's fix our eyes on jesus now even in this room now if you've not been fixing your eyes on jesus if you've been distracted if something shiny over there has had your attention you know, if something, um, I don't know, um, which sparks passion or even lust over there has had your attention, let's drop it. Let's walk away and fix our eyes on Jesus. This is the, the glorious king. And, um, and he's he sat now on the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He is our sweet, wonderful, perfect Jesus. Four. Then, this bombshell. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. When you read that, you go, what are you talking about? It's like, it's like, I barely understand why it just went from, it went from 100 to zero. It's like the brakes screeched. It went from the exact rep glory and exact representation of it being sustaining all things by his powerful word after he provided pur purification for sins. Let's not forget that. I'm coming back to that at the end. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And, and, and so he became as much superior to the angels as the name. He was as superior to theirs. It's a little bit like, you could have gone on for a chapter a little bit more, you know. What's this about? Anyway, this is what this is about. We'll, do, we'll untangle this one. Um, Deuteronomy 33, 2. 
I'm gonna go there straight away. If you want to go there, that will be useful. We will not have to. Um, this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Surely it is you who love the people, and all the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet they all bow down. And from you receive instruction, the law that Moses gave us. The possession of the assembly of Jacob. Okay, now just to clarify that the, the, the Jews thought that angels were the ministering spirits that gave the law. Okay, God gave the law, but the agents between that were the angels. Okay, so that's what the Jews thought. And let's just turn to Acts um, 7.53, which should be familiar because we did it a few weeks ago. Uh, I'll read from 51. Uh, this is Stephen. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Okay? So this is what their thinking was about angels. So this bunch of people who were meeting together these Jews who were meeting together as believers believed that the angels were part of the their little kind of fan you know that the rock stars along with Moses and the Levitical priesthood okay that's and we're going to unpack some of that later on but first of all this author deals with angels can you, can you see why he said this Jesus is there glory for him power but you're concentrating on angels let's just Un un unpack this now and tell you why Jesus is better than angels so he became much as superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs and that name is the son he's the son of God that's the name that he's inherited that's what that's what the name that children inherit from fathers son you can call someone their name but they're actually his son before they're anything else five for of which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Some translations say, You are, you are my son, I have begotten you. Yeah. Have you got that one? Yeah. Yep, so that's a better translation, I think. Uh, that's from Psalm 27. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Six, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angel work, work, angels worship him Deuteronomy 32 43 you've got to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint for that but we're not going to get into that tonight the previous one there where mm. it says um, speak up I'll, where it says I'll be to him a father and he shall be to me a son um, that goes to Sam, 2 Samuel 7 yep they've all got um, like sure and, and that's a complex one because he's, he's, he's speaking um, that, that it's prophetic um, of David's direct offspring but also because of David's offspring prophetically would be Christ you know it's, you've got to divide that up in, uh, prophetically and um, I just didn't want to go there tonight because it's a different subject but thanks for that um, um, and again when God brings the firstborn into the world he says let all God's angels worship him oh I said that one didn't I Deuteronomy 32:43. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. Psalm 104, 4. Everyone got that? But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All right, so you can't get more clear than that, can you? Any questions? Anyone taking notes? I've got a list of things that angels do in the scriptures, if, you, if them are useful, uh, but it would make it an hour of a Bible study. But if you want them, I've got them. They praise God, Psalms uh, 148, verses 1 to 2, and Isaiah 6, 3. They worship God, Hebrews 1, 6, we just read it, Revelation 5, 8, and verses following. They rejoice, this is angels, they rejoice in God, Job 38, 6-7. They serve God, Psalm 103, 20 and Revelation 22, 9. 
they appear um, appear by God. Job, job, Job one six and two one. Uh, the instruments of God's judgment. Uh, Revelation seven one and eight. Um, they are, uh, bring answer to prayer. Acts twelve five to ten. They aid in evangelism. Acts eight twenty six and ten three. They um, they observe the Christian life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. One Corinthians four verse nine. And they encourage. They encourage. Uh, Acts twenty seven twenty three. And they uh, are there at your death. Luke sixteen twenty two. So if you want to listen back to this and dig them out, you can do a, probably an hour's study looking through all them and find out what angels actually do. But none of them ascend, p give purification for sins. They're not the exact representation of God's being. They are not um, um, the Son. They were not begotten by the Father. They're not glorified. They're not lifted up. And they're not heralded. Verse 10, just to finish this. Um, we'll probably do just 35, 40 minutes. I don't know. We'll see how we, how we go. Ten, he also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will well wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. Just want to point something out about this. Is that um, we get like a... Um, a little bit of a timeline here as he's doing this so the author has put a bit of a timeline in I can see this let's see if you can see it all right uh, which of the angels did God ever say you you have, be you have become um, you are my son today I've become your father it's like the birth of Jesus or I will be his father he will be my son a little bit around the same thing let all God's angels worship him he makes angels winds and servants of fire then but about the son now this refers to the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year reign of Christ. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. That can be seen to be the millennial reign. And then the next bit is um, 10. In the beginning, now this is about the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And that's the context for the rest of what's said. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. When does this happen? The new heavens and the new earth after the millennial reign. So there's a slight hint of a timeline here. Um, oh, like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So um, there's a hint of Ephesians there as well where, um, you know, the, the Lord has been made the, the captain of salvation. He's the Lord of all and all authority, dominion and power has been given to him. And now we're living in a time when everything is being brought under Christ. When you became a Christian, okay, when you decided to follow Jesus, and there must be a time when that happened for you, when you, you got to that place where you went, I've got, I can see the light. You know, previously it was all confusion. The Bible was just a book, you know, keeping my door open or shut. You know, um, and now I can see it. It's the Word of God. God's made that happen. The scales have fell from my eyes. I can see clearer than I've ever seen that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then from that moment, there'll be a, a growth, however slow, it doesn't matter. You know, but there'll be a growth, a flourishing of understanding a little bit about what God, that has to have happened. Okay. Um, and then... That's you being brought under Christ, His Lordship, you know. And then, and but these things about us don't think that you, that the bits that aren't going well for you are not under His Lordship. They are under His Lordship, but you're still a work in progress. And we're going to talk next week. I haven't finished this yet, but we're going to talk next week about something. Um, how can perfect be made perfect? It sounds confusing. But it will make sense when we read chapter 2 next week. Uh, how, how, will, how can perfect be made perfect? Because it does. I'll just drop something on you now. In bring, 10, 2, 10, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the offer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Dun, dun, dun. I smell a contradiction. But there isn't one, and I'll tell you why next week, unless you find it out yourself. But just to go back to a couple of things, 1.14, are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve 
to those who will inherit salvation. So whether you like it or not, um, you are in, if you're a real believer, a true believer, and you've given your heart away to Jesus, and you are born again, you know that you know that you know that you know that you know who Jesus is, and you've had a, got a, a, a relationship with the Lord, then um, you will um, be being brought under His Lordship, and um, you'll be able to partake in all that kind of stuff. So. Um, you are you are inheriting salvation, um, and then the and the, the 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 sanctification bit is going on, but the salvation bit is already, you know, it's already in place. You've you saved. You're not being saved in the sense that you if you died under you know in God forbid under a, a under a bus or something tomorrow that you know only part of you'll be saved. You know, I don't know. that's not true. But um, all everything's in God's will. All things are under His will. Everything are under his uh, care and his power and his protection including the stop button you know so nothing we should fear nothing idealistic yes are we all there where we fear nothing no but we we can get to a place where we're so fixated by his risen glory that our passing troubles are not going to impact us so much as to stop us hinder us and the devil doesn't like that so up goes the attack up goes the spiritual warfare and then we find ourselves living an exciting life because we're on the right side the light you know and um so angels ministering spirits sent those to, to those who inherit salvation whether you like it or not angels are working in your life right now it's you're just unavoidable you know i want to see angels do you when anyone sees an angel in there terror and they, that's why they say do not be afraid because they're probably like, ah, oh! you know, and um, I always like it when it says that. It kind of makes me chuckle a bit because yeah. it's like they're probably like nine foot and they've got a sword in their hand which is glowing with the eternal flames of the Lord, right? And they've got like eyes, like, and they kind of stood there. Do not be afraid. So Yeah, I mean, if something appears in a room, you're just going to be scared anyway. It's like, do not be afraid, because oh, you know, so like. But if you, <laughs> yeah. you, we've encountered angels unawares. It says in the Bible, it says you've right. encountered angels. You'll have. I went to Prague years and years ago, decades ago, really, and um, I was doing a mission. And we had to get on this train. If we didn't get on this train, we couldn't go to Munich. Uh, we'd have missed it, and we would have had to have no money. We've got no money, no accommodation, and it was freezing. And um, and I'm running through this train station. I stopped, and I looked at this guy. Now, this is not like your story, which is really impressive. This is a bit lame. But I stopped like that, and I said, which platform is the train to Munich? And he said, some, and he told me the platform. And uh, I had a funny feeling about how he told me, because he kind of looked at me and smiled like that. I can't remember what platform it was. Platform three. And he just looked at me with a knowing look, and I'm like, what the heck? And I, I kind of glanced around as I'm set off running again, and his newspaper was upside down. And I thought that was really weird. I thought it was like, because we were panicking. I'm in the middle of Europe, and I'm like, you know, yeah. 23, mental yeah. age, 7, you know what I mean? I just don't know what I'm doing. I need adult supervision anyway, most of the time. But this is, um, this is probably never got any of that, did it? It's, it's actually multi-directional. So, um, so that's, that. They, they're all around us all the time, and um, they are ministering. So I have faith that God has got this sorted out, you know? And he's got, you, you know, lots of things going on. We, the devil wants to get us isolated. He wants to get us thinking God doesn't care. He cares for the, all the, you know, hot shot preachers, and he's got like an agenda for the busy, the busy. Because obviously spirituality means busyness. No, it doesn't. Spirituality it doesn't mean what? The what? So don't forget the rich. Oh, of course, the rich people who've, um, you know, got ministry tapes and the, yeah. you know, selling God's word for a profit. Not that it's an issue. But um, you know, no, God's got ministering angels to you, because precious you, is. A child of God. Precious you is um, eternally destined, whether you like it or not. If I've said anything tonight that's kind of like, you know, oh, I need to talk a little bit, what do you mean by that? Then obviously get in touch, talk to me, that's cool. Uh, but I just wanted to go back to just verse 3, 
where it says after he had provided purification for sins now to a to a jew who listens to that after he provided purification for sins nobody in the world or outside of the world could ever do that except god it's provocative all right so the so this is there's an assumption here that these people these are hebrews who are saved because otherwise it's a, it's a bad thing and i want i want to tell you tonight that um Jesus' purification for sins, his salvation, is so thorough and universal. And we're going to find out a little bit about some things that we've probably never talked about in this group, about what's provided for in the atonement. That um, it's just like, you cannot get it wrong. Okay, As a true believer, you can't get it wrong. If you, you can try and get it wrong, but you'll only end up miserable because you love Jesus and you want to walk well with him. You know, and you want to have a good relationship with the Lord and stuff. But um, it's so complete that you can't miss it. And sometimes we get insecurities and the devil says, you are the exception to the rule. You're the one who's getting it wrong all the time. You with your particular dark museum of this that and the other that you're always going to and it's always there and you oh you know I have some success for a while but then there you go again you know and it's like his salvation is bigger than that you know and I want us to if we go away tonight you know setting ourselves calibrating ourselves to really get into Hebrews for the next few weeks then we're going to see Jesus in a new light. And some of you guys who are mature in the faith and all that, you're going to see Jesus in a refreshed light. And hopefully, you know, after we go home, have a cup of tea or whatever you're going to do, get up in the morning, you know, just think these things through, the exact representation of his glory, sustaining all things, all things by his powerful word. There we go. You got away with 41 minutes and 42 seconds. Any questions? Anything pressing we can just go to right now? Yeah. So, the, the, next week, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a, um, a taster for next week. Uh, Jesus, um, it's, it's ch chapter 2, verse 10. You have to read it all, really, to teach it properly. But it says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. So if Jesus is perfect, and he is, and the author says this several times in here, he is the perfect one. The Moses wasn't, the law wasn't, and the angels aren't. You know what I mean? But Jesus is perfect. How would he need to be made perfect through suffering? And we're going to have to look at some of the Greek there. Perfect. How do you make perfect perfect? So, so there's there's explanations for that, but it's just something to put that into your thoughts for this week until we meet next Tuesday at the same time here, and um, and then you know just kind of I'll try and explain it as best as, I can, as we can see it really. Make sense? No. It's actually there's a couple of, there's a couple of theories out there, but. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's like, I feel like explaining it now, but I'm not going to. I'll just pray. Yeah, <laughs> Father, we thank you for this. Um, whatever I've stumbled over tonight, I pray you'll, by your spirit, make it sensible to someone. Uh, make it help um, formation of um, just just a, a mind that's uh, being renewed and restored and rebuilt by you, Father. And we want to um, we want to put our eyes on our lovely Jesus and and just calibrate ourselves to that for the next few weeks and well all our life really and um, and you really really try to enjoy your word and really try to enjoy you in practice put legs on our faith lord and we do pray that we can all um, have traveling mercies as we go on and um, bless us in our in the rest of our week and until sunday and still bless us then amen